I'd rather not admit as to how old I am, but I have to confess that during my formative years, when I took an interest in weightlifting and bodybuilding, Schwarzenegger was king. And looking at the gunk show, it's no surprise as to why. There's all the focus on the biceps, but there's a heck of a lot more to this region of the body than just this one muscle. This region is the focus of the present session. Welcome back. In today's first session, we considered the elbow joint, which allows flexion and extension between the arm and the forearm. We now consider the muscles that generate this flexion and extension by looking at the brachium or upper arm region. There's a laundry list of objectives that we need to get to for this session. First, we're going to compartmentalize, organize the muscles and neurovascular structures into anterior and posterior compartments and identify commonalities between components of a given compartment. Second, we'll take a specific look at the muscles found in the brachium, consider their origin and insertion points, and discuss the actions that they can produce. We're also going to discuss the course of neurovascular structures that run through the brachial region and highlight the importance of collateral circulation in this region. Finally, we're going to take a look at the components of the cubital fossa, which is the anterior side of the elbow, and the surface anatomy of this region as a whole. And of course, peppered through the lesson will be a good number of clinical correlations, just for good measure. To make things easier to conceptualize, it helps to compartmentalize structures within the upper and lower limbs. In doing so, it allows us to recognize a number of commonalities within a given compartment. Muscles belonging to a single compartment will have similar actions and have a similar nerve and blood supply. An understanding of this can assist in making connections between different concepts. If, for example, a loss in a specific function can often be traced to a specific nerve lesion using the principles of compartmentalization. In the arm, we can identify two specific muscular compartments, anterior and posterior. Muscles of the anterior compartment serve principally as flexors of the elbow, are innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve, and are supplied by branches of the brachial artery. Muscles of the posterior compartment are extensors of the elbow, innervated by the radial nerve, and supplied by the profunda brachia artery. Also note the presence of a medial neurovascular compartment, containing vital structures that are provided a measure of protection from the humerus and muscular compartments laterally, superiorly, and inferiorly, and the thoracic wall medially. It's recommended that you refer back to this as a summary slide to help you with your focus on the material. Time to take a look at the musculature of the brachium, starting with the anterior compartment. We have a total of three muscles to consider. First is the coracobrachialis. As its name implies, it originates from the coracoid process to insert on the medial surface of the mid shaft of the humerus. As it doesn't project into the forearm, it has no direct effect on elbow joint movement. Instead, it contracts to adduct and flex the shoulder joint. It also serves a stabilization role similar to the rotator cuff muscles, contracting isometrically to resist the pull of gravity on the upper limb, particularly when carrying a heavy load. Inferior to the coracobrachialis is the brachialis muscle. In this case, the muscle has a broad origin off the distal anterior shaft of the humerus and inserts on the proximal anterior shaft of the ulna. As it crosses anterior to the elbow joint, it contracts to flex the elbow with equal strength in either pronation or supination. The most superficial of the anterior compartment muscles is the bicep brachii. Its name stems from a proximal divergence of its muscle belly, resulting in two points of tendon attachment. The short head originates from the coracoid process in a more direct route. The long head passes through the bicipital groove. From here, we lose sight of the tendon superficially as it dives deep to merge with the joint capsule, ultimately blending into the glenoid labrum to insert on the supraglenoid tubercle. Distally, the heads converge to insert on the radial tuberosity along the lateral surface of the proximal radial shaft. In addition to this thick tendinous attachment, a thin aponeurosis diverges from the tendon to blend medially into the superficial fascia of the forearm. As it crosses anterior to both the shoulder and elbow, it serves as a flexor of both these joints. It also serves as the principal supinator of the forearm, an action we will address in more detail in the next section.
As part of the anterior compartment, all three muscles are innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve and supplied by muscular branches off the brachial artery. Because of its torturous route that it takes, the tendon for the long head of the biceps experiences a great deal of wear and tear in the shoulder region. As a result, tendon rupture is not uncommon past the fifth decade of life. Rupture typically occurs at the attachment point, but may also be seen distal to this point. The patient typically presents with pain in the acute phase and noticing an audible popping sensation in the shoulder. Proximal bruising and a distinct deformity, typically called a Popeye arm due to its resemblance to the cartoon character, is observed. Surgical repair involves reattaching the tendon, typically to the tendon of the short head, which has minimal effect on overall function. In truth, many elderly individuals decline the surgery as the continued actions of the short head is sufficient to maintain almost normal function with only moderate losses in strength. More debilitating is a rupture to the distal tendon, resulting in complete loss of function of the bicep. Notice the proximal bulge observed with this injury, the opposite of what was seen with the proximal rupture. Surgical repair requires reattachment to the radial tuberosity and rehabilitation is a lengthy process. The posterior compartment contains a single muscle of note. The triceps brachii is so named because of the three separate muscle bellies that converge on a single tendon for insertion. The long head originates off the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. It can be identified superficially as the proximal medial bulge in the muscle. Of the three heads, it is the only one that crosses the shoulder joint. The lateral head originates off the lateral surface of the proximal shaft of the humerus. It can be observed superficially as a lateral bulge of the tricep muscle. The medial head originates off the posteromedial surface of the mid shaft of the humerus. Only the distal portion of the muscle is observed superficially, emerging distal to the inferior border of the long head as it tapers towards the tricep tendon. As a whole, the tricep muscle acts to extend the elbow. The long head would also play a minor role in shoulder extension and adduction. The muscle is supplied by the radial nerve and the profunda brachia artery. And one additional muscle to mention at this point is the anconius. It doesn't precisely belong to the posterior compartment as it originates off the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, inserting on the posterior surface of the ulna along the olecranon process, but as it is also an extensor of the elbow and is innervated by the radial nerve, we include it in our discussion here. We next turn our attention to the vascular supply of the brachium. In our previous lesson, we traced the subclavian artery into the axillary artery, which supplies the entire upper limb. Past the inferior border of the teres major muscle, the axillary artery becomes the brachial artery, which is the principal artery of the arm and which sends branches to supply the anterior compartment of the arm. The artery travels in the medial neurovascular compartment before shifting anteriorly in the cubital fossa to split into the radial and ulnar arteries, which we will discuss in the upcoming lesson. Just distal to the surgical neck of the humerus, the brachial artery gives off the profunda brachia artery which courses through the triangular interval, joining the radial nerve deep in the posterior compartment to supply blood to this region. Also note the presence of a number of collateral branches off both the brachial and profunda brachia arteries. The superior and inferior ulnar collateral arteries branch from the brachial artery, running posterior and anterior to the medial epicondyle respectively, to anastomose with the anterior and posterior ulnar recurrence. The middle collateral and radial collateral come off the profunda brachia artery to anastomose with the radial recurrent and recurrent interosseous arteries. The importance of collateral circulation is highlighted in elbow flexion when the distal end of the brachial artery bends with the elbow joint to angles as extreme as 40 degrees. Think of a garden hose and what happens to the flow of water when a portion of the hose is bent. Same thing with a major artery. The flow of blood is impeded through the vessel during flexion. In instances of prolonged flexion, blood can still reach the forearm through collateral branches, which are not bent to as great as extreme. This is a temporary remedy as the collaterals can't supply as much blood as required for an extended period of time, but it does allow us to maintain a bent elbow position for more than a few seconds without concern of damage to distal tissues from blood occlusion. The veins of the brachium travel in the same pattern as seen with the arteries and carry the same names. Veins in the appendices tend to travel in pairs, bilateral to the arteries. This vascular arrangement, 
a single artery traveling with between two veins is known as vena comitantis. The arrangement allows for the pumping of blood back to the heart during each pulse beat. In addition, we again see the laterally oriented cephalic vein as well as the medially oriented basilic vein superficially. The basilic vein penetrates the fascia of the brachium medially diffused with the brachial vein at the level of the axillary vein. Both the anterior and posterior compartments contain a single nerve supply. The musculocutaneous nerve enters the anterior compartment by piercing the coracobrachialis muscle. It then runs lateral and inferior, giving off muscular branches to biceps brachii and brachialis before emerging as a lateral antibrachial cutaneous nerve to supply the skin over top of the lateral surface of the forearm. Generally speaking, the muscular compartment is supplied by C5 and 6 spinal nerve contributions, while the cutaneous continuation is from C7 spinal nerve. The radial nerve is observed in the posterior compartment, spiraling around the shaft of the humerus between the attachments of the lateral and medial head of the triceps muscle, which it innervates in this compartment. It also provides cutaneous branches at this point that detect sensation along the back of the arm and forearm. It courses anterior to the lateral epicondyle before diving into the posterior compartment of the forearm. As we'll see in the next lesson, this distal part of the radial nerve innervates the muscles of the posterior compartment of the forearm, as well as the dorsal lateral surface of the hand. Two other nerves to mention pass through the brachium protected in the medial neurovascular compartment, but provide no direct neural innervation. The median nerve is seen just medial to the brachial artery. As with the artery, it courses anterior to the cubital fossa before diving deep into the anterior compartment of the forearm. The ulnar nerve is initially found closely related to the median nerve, but then travels posterior to run behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. It also penetrates the anterior compartment, but on the medial side in a different location from the median nerve. We'll continue to trace the course of the radial, median, and ulnar nerves in the next lesson. Surface anatomy is primarily related to the muscular contours in the arm. The bicep is prominent in the anterior compartment. The medial border creates a furrow deep to which the brachialis can be palpated. Between these muscle bellies lies the medial neurovascular compartment, which can also be carefully palpated. The heads of the tricep can be observed on the posterior surface. Note the furrow separating the long and medial heads in the horseshoe shape of the triceps tendon. The electronon process and medial and lateral epicondyles can also be palpated. As you are doing this, you should try to recall the various neurovascular structures that pass anterior and posterior to these structures. We finish our discussion and lead into our discussion of the forearm by looking at the cubital fossa. This is the region just anterior to the elbow that contains important neurovascular structures. It protects these structures from stretching during elbow flexion and from mechanical trauma typically experienced when bumping your elbow. The space is triangular, defined by imaginary lines connecting the epicondyles and the borders of the brachioradialis and pronator teres muscles, which we will discuss in the next lesson. The floor of the cubital fossa is formed by the brachialis muscle proximally and another forearm muscle, the supinator distally. The roof of the fossa is covered by the superficial fascia, which is slightly thicker in this region due to the presence of the bicipital aponeurosis. This provides a little more protection to the underlying structures from penetrating injuries. The most prominent of these contents are the terminal portion of the brachial artery and the median nerve, which each lie just medial to the biceps tendon. Lateral to the biceps tendon is the radial nerve. The space is distinct enough that a pulse can often be detected superficially just over the brachial artery. A clinical consideration to the region is the presence of an additional superficial vein just superior to the fascial roof, the median cubital vein. This is a common site for needle sticks as the vein is readily accessible and easy to identify. Phlebotomists must practice caution when drawing blood from this site. If the angle of the needle is too steep, it may pierce the roof of the cubital fossa and damage the neurovascular structures beneath. This concludes our lesson on the brachium and elbow. In the next session, we move to the antebrachium, better known as the forearm, to identify the muscular components and continue tracing the paths of the neurovascular structures that pass into this region. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.